Will you all join me in a moment of prayer? Gracious and powerful God, we pray that you would be with us in these moments. That you would stir in this space and in our hearts. That you would relieve any anxiety and worry. That you would speak to the deepest hopes. Calling us closer to you. In this moment and beyond. Amen. Our scripture story today is a pretty familiar one, and it's actually way weirder than what we have let it become. We tend to read it as a story about Jesus being calm and the disciples freaking out because they don't have enough faith. But when we read it a little bit deeper, there are more and more layers. Hear this reflection from the poet Mary Oliver. This poem is entitled, Maybe. Sweet Jesus, talking his melancholy madness, stood up in the boat and the sea lay down, silky and sorry. So everybody was saved that night. But you know how it is when something different crosses the threshold. The uncles mutter together, the women walk away, the young brother begins to sharpen his knife. Nobody knows what the soul is. It comes and goes like the wind over the water. Sometimes for days you don't think of it. Maybe... After the sermon, after the multitude was fed, one or two of them felt the soul slip forth like a tremor of pure sunlight before exhaustion that wants to swallow everything gripped in their bones and left them miserable and sleepy as they are now, forgetting how the wind tore at the sails before he rose and talked to it. Tender and luminous and demanding as he always was, a thousand times more frightening than the killer sea. I want to dive into the text, and I want to pause also and acknowledge the mask in my pocket. Um, I am not currently um, positive for anything. But out of an abundance of caution, I will be wearing a mask um, when I'm around anybody else. Now, let's dive into the text. To do that, it's helpful to backtrack a little bit in Scripture. I think it's always helpful to look back and see what's been happening so that we can understand better what's going on now. That's also true in our lives and in our world, right? In Mark, we need to remember that the first eight chapters happen around the Sea of Galilee. One commentator said that this is a seaside tale. Early in chapter 3, when they have left the synagogue and they're going out to the seaside, Jesus starts to notice the size of the crowd, how it keeps growing and growing. So he tells the disciples in chapter 3, verse 9, to go get a boat ready just in case they need it. Then he takes the disciples and he goes up a mountain. Now around the Sea of Galilee, there are a lot of cliffs. And I had a chance to go with Bishop Carter several years ago um, with a group of other clergy. And we climbed up to the top of the cliff of Arbel and we looked out over the Sea of Galilee. And I imagine Jesus and the disciples climbing up some of those rocky cliffs so that they could have that powerful overlook of the whole area as he appointed the twelve. When he comes back down, it's the scene we talked about two weeks ago when I was here. 
where the scribes are all accusatory and Jesus' family gets it a little bit wrong and Jesus realigns the idea of family. And so on this day, in chapter 4 of Mark, Jesus is out again by the seaside teaching. The crowd does get so big that he decides to use that boat that they had set aside to keep the crowd from crushing in. So, you can imagine it. He's been out on this boat all day teaching, sitting or standing, projecting his voice out so that those on the shore would hear him. He's gone through a lot. Like, he has covered a lot of ground on this day. He's talked about the parable of the soils. And when people didn't understand that, he took the time to break it down and explain it so that they could understand it. He talked about parables of lamps hidden under bushels and measures received being equal or greater than the measures given. He's talked about the kingdom of God and the image of a seed. First, a seed from planting through harvest, and then a mustard seed that grows and grows beyond, beyond, and becomes shade for birds to make their nests. You can imagine him out there all day in that boat, telling the stories, Reiterating points so that people would get some of it. The hours and hours that pass. Now I know y'all just recently did VBS. And so you can imagine the end of the day. And the exhaustion setting in. So when it's time, when they need a little bit of space... Jesus suggests that they take that boat, that they go on across to the other side of the lake. And the text says that, leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. So they set out in the boat to cross the Sea of Galilee, which is really a big, shallow lake. And Jesus lies down for a nap doesn't take long before the weather turns. You've heard that joke about Florida, right? If you don't like the weather, wait 10 minutes. It's a similar scenario as evening is setting in, and the disciples would have known that that was a possibility. Storms popped up, popped up often in the evenings as the conditions and temperatures changed they would know how serious this could be. The Sea of Galilee was dangerous at night, and a sudden storm could be catastrophic for those who were on board. These folks who were traveling with Jesus had likely made this kind of trip before. They would know the stories about nighttime storms, about boats broken, about people lost. Their grief might have been activated, or their own previous experiences might have come rushing back in a wave of worry. So here they are, in the midst of this huge and ominous storm. And Jesus is just asleep somehow. His calm contrasts with their fear and might even make it worse. Like, what are we missing? Doesn't he care? Is he okay? How can he be asleep at a time like this? And then when Jesus is awakened, he doesn't respond the way a chaplain would by honoring their worries, acknowledging the storm whirling up around them, 
offering calming words of scripture. No, Jesus wakes up grumpy. He says the thing that they may have been afraid of. Where is your faith? Why are you afraid? He does not respond to their mid-nap disruption with the compassion or pastoral care that we might expect or want. Instead, he claps back, mirroring their fears and their failures. He chastises them, really, for not being more centered in their faith, more composed in the situation, more assured of the nature of Jesus as the Son of God. And he yells at the sea to be silent, to be still. When that works, uh, rather than increasing their fear, the disciples are in that kind of awe that goes beyond wonder into confusion and shock. They realize they don't really all the way know who this Jesus guy is. They know the sea. They know what it's capable of. But what is Jesus capable of? Who is this guy? They don't just know the sea, though. They would have also known the tales of God calming the chaos of the waters in the creation story. They would know the story of God parting the Red Sea as a means of liberation and protection. They might even recall the story of Job hearing from God in the whirlwind. And the writer of the Gospel of Mark uses the same word for storm here that is used for that whirlwind in Job 38. You know, maybe it's just too much to try and understand that this man they were getting to know is somehow also God. The signs were there. And they were unbelievable and terrifying and exhilarating and incredible. Now in John's gospel, as people see miracles done, they grow in their faith. But that is not what happens in Mark. In this gospel, people are early adopters and later skeptics. They're quick to jump into faith. And they seem to get startled over and over and over again by what it would really mean to believe in Jesus. In fact, in this gospel, the disciples are prone to fear when Jesus wants them to have faith. The scholar Sharon Ring says that there are six times in Mark when the disciples are Seized by the fear that blends terror and awe. The fear that blends terror and awe. Two of those times, one third, are related to the sea. And Jesus calming it. This story that we're talking about, and then later in chapter 6, when he walks out on the water to calm it and... The disciples' nerves. I can understand that fear and that overwhelm at what is even what what? The disciples can tell there's something really different about Jesus. I mean they they've left their homes, their work, their lives to go with him teaching and healing all over the area. They've climbed mountains, they've sat in synagogues, they have crossed the sea. 
And Jesus has told confusing stories and healed people and rebuked demons. And in this moment, he actually rebukes the sea. The sea obeyed him in the same way that the demons did. Jesus' rebuke has an unimaginable effect. Y'all, I think the thing about Jesus is that we can never fully understand. We can feel his power. We can live in the mystery. We can try to be wholeheartedly along for the journey. But as soon as we think we understand, God is doing something new. Transforming something again. Transforming us again. So maybe part of the lesson here is that faith is not certainty. It's reverent wonder mixed with hope and trust soaked in grace. Maybe Jesus is urging them to live in the trust, to live in the hope. The writer Anne Lamott says that hope begins in the dark. The stubborn hope that if you just show up and try to do the right thing, the dawn will come. You wait and you watch and you work. You don't give up. Henri Nouwen said something similar. He said, hope means living amid desperation. And to keep humming in the darkness. I wonder if maybe Jesus is startled because it seems like the disciples have lost hope. Maybe he's dismayed because what he has been offering again and again and again is hope. And hope is the persistent, unflagging seed of trust. I'm not talking about like hopes and dreams, like the things you want to accomplish in your life. We are talking about the deep, aching hope that something else is possible. Jean Carr once said, Hope is the feeling you have that the feeling you have isn't permanent. In the first service, uh, during the hymn sing, I asked that we sing hymn 512, Stand By Me. Because whenever I read this passage, or the other one where Jesus walks out on the water, That's the song that comes to me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the host of hell assail and my strength begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, Stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. When I've done the best I can and my friends misunderstand, thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, stand by me. When my foes in war array undertake to stop my way, thou who saved Paul and Silas, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When my life becomes a burden, and I'm nearing chilly Jordan. O thou lily of the valley, stand by me.
Y'all, isn't that our deepest hope? That when things go wrong, we're not alone? We have a chance all the time, every day, to be a sign of God's presence and love with others in our world. We heard in the Residing Hope video this morning, one of the ways that the United Methodist Children's Home is a place where kids know that they are not alone, even if that's how they've always felt before. My granddaddy was adopted, and on fifth Sundays at First Church Gainesville, he would dress up in a pink suit with a little straw boater hat that he had gotten at the children's home, and he would uh, stand up in front of the congregation and encourage them to share and to make a difference in the lives of children in the way that his life had been changed. Isn't it our deepest hope that when things go wrong, we're not alone? Later in Mark, as I said, the disciples will be out on a boat again, on the stormy sea. And this time, Jesus will leave his spot of prayer on the beach and walk out to them. He'll calm the sea again. And this time, Peter will try to walk out on the water, too. And again, the faith and the trust won't fully be there. But the hope is. And regardless, Jesus shows up again and again. No matter how deep our faith runs or how sure it feels when the wind is whipping around us or how fearful we are when the waves are crashing over us, Jesus shows up and calms the storm. And we don't know how. But we do know that we're not alone. And we trust, however feebly, the hope that in some way, some unexpected, impossible way, Christ will settle the storm. And as John Wesley said in his last moments, best of all is, God is with us. Amen.